If you haven't done so yet, pause the video and reread the problem before listening on. In this question, we have a continuous distribution of charge. In other problems, you may have charges that are sort of discrete. You might have a positive charge over here, maybe a negative charge over there, and you want to calculate the electric potential at a point P. That's a much easier task because you have individual charges. But here we have a charged rod, so there is a sort of distribution of charges. You can almost think of this as an infinite number of charges lined up one next to the other. And each one of those infinite number of charges is going to contribute some electric potential over here at point P1. The charges that are closer to P1 will contribute more potential because they're closer to point P. The charges that are further away will contribute less because they are further away from point P1. So how do we do this? How can we find the total electric potential at a point when we have a continuous charge distribution with these charges spread out along a rod. And the answer is that we're going to break the rod into tiny elements. We're actually just gonna focus on one of those tiny elements. We're gonna create an expression for the potential produced by that tiny element, and then we're going to sum all of the infinite number of tiny elements. And we will do that via integration. That's what integration does. It's a mathematical procedure for adding up the total contribution of an infinite number of little things, basically. So how do we begin to do this? Well, let's zoom in on the diagram. And what we're going to do is, as noted, select a tiny section of this rod. They sometimes call it a differential element, but it's basically just a really teeny piece of the rod. So let's just mark it. There it is right there. That's a teeny little piece. And because it's so teeny, we actually annotate its width as dx. In calculus, when you have a tiny dimension, a tiny length, then that tiny length is annotated as a dx. And what we'll notice is that the distance from the origin to our little differential element, that distance right there could be labeled as x. And then there's an additional distance that we have to get to point P1, so that additional distance is D. So in other words, the total distance from our differential element to point P1 is going to be X plus D. So just keep that in mind. Now, how do we figure out the electric potential contributed by that tiny little differential element? We can derive a clue from the equation for the electric potential produced by a point charge. You probably have seen that the potential produced by a point charge is K times Q divided by the distance from the charge to the point in question. Now that would be true for a point charge. For a little differential element of charge, we're going to modify that equation slightly. We're going to use differential notation. So instead of saying V, we're going to say DV because that little differential element is contributing a teeny tiny amount of electric potential at point P1. So because it's teeny tiny, we use the dV notation. And then over here, we have this constant. Q is going to actually be, you guessed it, dQ. It's a tiny amount of charge on that tiny little differential element. There is a little bit of charge on that differential element. We call that dQ. And then that's going to be over the distance from our differential element to point P1. We've said that that distance is x plus d. So this is looking pretty good. In fact, it's so good looking, we're going to move it down here and paste it. But the problem we have right now is we've got two variables. We've got x and dq. And it's not going to be so easy to integrate that later if we have two variables. So somehow we have to relate x and dq together so that we can kind of condense it into just one variable. And perhaps you've heard of something called the linear charge density. We're going to be using the linear charge density. That's often symbolized by lambda. And the linear charge density is basically just the total amount of charge on the rod. And that was given way back here. The total amount of charge on the rod was capital Q. So the linear charge density is capital Q. And then that's divided by the length of the rod, which is L. Now the units of charge are coulombs and the units of length, of course, are meters. So what we're saying is that the linear charge density is the number of coulombs per meter. So how does that help us? How does that help us figure out the amount of charge on our little differential element. Well, in a moment, we're going to show you that the amount of charge, dq, could equal the linear charge density multiplied by that teeny tiny little length of the differential element. That teeny tiny little length was dx. Now, just pause here. Let's make sure this makes sense. The lambda, as noted, is measured in coulombs per meter. 
and then dx is a linear dimension. It's a tiny dimension, but it is linear. It's a length, so that's measured in meters. And if we multiply that, the meters would cancel, and that would leave us with coulombs. And that dimensionally is nice and consistent because dq represents the number of coulombs as well. It's the number of coulombs on that little tiny differential element. So dimensionally, it checks out. We can see that dq is equal to the linear charge density times dx. We're going to make that substitution. We're going to plug lambda dx in for the dq here. But as noted, lambda itself can be substituted with capital Q over L. So we're going to make that substitution as well. And that's pretty nifty because now our variable x is sort of aligned with this dx. It makes it integratable. We have that internal consistency in our variable. And that's exactly what we're going to do next. To get the total electric potential, we take that little charge element and then all of the other little charge elements. Remember, this rod is composed of essentially an infinite number of little charged differential elements. We need to add them all together and that's what integration does. We're going to integrate both sides of this equation and that is the procedure for summing all of those electric potential contributions from each of the little differential elements. Now, when we integrate, we need bounds. And our rod is what we're integrating across. The rod is bounded from an x value of 0 to another x value of L. So our lower and upper limits are from 0 to L. On the left side of this integral, we have the integral of dv. You probably know from your studies of calculus that that just gives you v. So that's going to be the electric potential that we are seeking at point P1. Now we have to integrate, and if we look carefully, we have some constants that can be factored out. Look at this group right here. And they might look like variables, but in fact, they're constants. K is the Coulomb constant. Capital Q is a constant because there's a constant total amount of charge on the rod. It's not like we're adding more charges to it or removing charges. So it's a constant value. And then the length of the rod, of course, is constant as well because we're not shrinking the rod. We're not elongating it. So all, is the, all of this is to say that we can factor out the KQ over L to the outside of the integral. You remember from calculus that you can factor out constants to the sort of outside of the integral. That's going to leave us in the numerator with just a 1 dx. I'll put the 1 here and the dx off to the side, and then we have x plus d. And we have to integrate this. So perhaps the best way for us to integrate 1 over x plus d is to use a u substitution. So you probably learned about this in calculus, and we're going to let u equal x plus d. And then what we do is we take the derivative. Now, notationally, the derivative of u is du dx. The derivative of 1x is just 1. d is a constant as well. Remember, little d was the distance from the origin to point p1. That distance is not changing. We're not sliding p1 around. So that d is a constant. The derivative of a constant is 0. So you have 1 plus 0, so that's just 1. Multiply both sides by dx, and you get du is equal to dx. So now we can look back at our original integral. Remember, it was the integral of 1 over x plus d dx. But we've made a substitution. So this can be rewritten as the integral of 1 over, well, x plus d was u. We made that equal to u, and then we showed that dx was equal to du. Now, you know this integral. This is 1 over u, and when you integrate 1 over u, you basically get the natural log of u. It's actually the absolute value of u, but our values of x and d are both positive. So we're just going to say u. There's no need to say the absolute value. And then we put back our u. Our u, if you look at the tippy top of the screen, was x plus d. So we do get the natural log of x plus d. Good. Now, let's go back to where we were. We were right here. We were integrating. And we just did that. We just did the u sub. So this is going to equal kq over l, those constants, multiplied by the natural log of x plus d. Oh, look, I put the absolute value back in, even though I said we didn't need to do that. So that's x plus d. Our bounds of integration are from 0 to l. Now, you'll remember from calculus, you have to plug l in. Remember, x is the variable. So just be sure you plug l in for x. And let's scoot this down. So here we go. We have V equals, I'm going to keep this KQ over L factored to the outside of this entire expression. So now we have the natural log 
of quantity L plus D. And then we're going to subtract what we get when we plug in the lower bound. We plug the lower bound in for X and we get the natural log of zero plus D, which is just D. Now, all of these values are known. They're given in the problem except for K, but that's a known constant. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to plug in everything that was given in the problem for capital Q, L, and lowercase d. Now, a couple of notes regarding the plugins here. The femtocoulombs, so that was the charge capital Q. It was in femtocoulombs, so you just make sure you multiply that by 10 to the negative 15th to get it into coulombs. And then the values of L and D were in centimeters. So for L and for D, we divided them by 100 to get them into meters. So 12 centimeters is 0.12 meters. 2.5 centimeters was 0.025 meters. So just make sure you do those unit conversions for your L's, D's, and Q's. And then when you compute this, your potential comes out to about 0 0.00739. And because this is potential, the standard unit is volts. That is the correct answer for the amount of electric potential at point P1.